Coming up on DTNS, DuckDuckGo wants to protect your email privacy, a new messenger alternative to WhatsApp, and why, Venmo, why, just why? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 20th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From sunny Canada, I'm Jen Cutter. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about those Netflix earnings that just came in, uh, losing 430000 in Canada and the U.S., but picking up $1.5 million worldwide and doubling down on gaming. If there's more out of that earnings call, we'll, uh, we'll be covering it in the days to come. But you can hear our first impressions on Good Day Internet. Become a member. Get that show. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology named 142 apps currently violating users' rights and given until July 26 to take corrective actions. Amazon's China app and NetEase's Dashen were cited for illegally collecting user information, and Tencent's live streaming app Huya reportedly deceived, misled, or forced users to turn on unspecified permissions. Amnesty International's researchers have provided a toolkit to help identify if your phone is one that has been targeted by NSO Group's Pegasus Skyware. It's called the Mobile Verification Toolkit, or MVT. So if you want your MVT, here's how to get it. Works on the command line. We'll take an entire iPhone backup and feed in for any indicators of compromise, even if the backup is encrypted. On Android, MVT can scan the device backup for text messages with links to domains known to be used by NSO and be able to tell you like, hey, you better watch out. The toolkit can also scan for potentially malicious apps installed on your device. It's available at Amnesty's GitHub page. Square is launching a suite of savings, checking, and lending services for merchants called Square Banking, powered by Square Financial Services Industrial Bank. It started operating back in March. Square Savings lets sellers put a percentage of each sale into a high-yield account and also create folders to track specific priorities and goals like taxes, emergency funds, things like that. Square Checking supports the Square Debit Card and ACH transfers and team payment with Square Payroll. And Square Loans offers financing options and lets merchants repay loans Loans with a percentage of their daily Square sales. YouTube has acquired SimSim, a social commerce startup that helps small businesses in India transition to e-commerce by connecting companies with influencers and customers. Idea is that micro-influencers, uh, that means they have small amount of influence, not that they're small themselves, can reach a targeted <laughs> audience, create entertainment, build trust, and offer personalized messaging more effectively than trying to run ads on a big social platform in order to reach the Indian market. Terms of the deal were not disclosed. Valve's new Steam Deck maxes out at 512 gigabytes of internal drive space, which might make you wonder how many games you can realistically play on the portable PC and how well. When asked about that on Twitter, Valve engineer Lawrence Yang said that Steam Deck games run really well on a micro SD card. Yang said, games will load faster off internal storage, but games still play great off an SD card. In fact, when IGN came by, all the games they tried and shot footage of were played off a micro SD card. All right, let's talk about DuckDuckGo. Privacy-focused search engine DuckDuckGo is offering an email protection feature. You get a free at duck.com email address. I mean, right there, that's fun, just to have a duck.com email address. But it also uh, will allow you to have anybody who emails you at that address get analyzed for trackers, which are then removed uh, before they are loaded the rest of the email is then forwarded along to your regular address. You'll see a small bar at the top of the email telling you what trackers were removed. You can also create unique disposable addresses from the DuckDuckGo mobile browser or browser extension. Those are meant for free trials or anything where you think, you know what, they might be selling my address to a spammer. Let me just let me just give them this one. And then you can easily deactivate that address without having to cut off everyone you've ever given your DuckDuckGo email to. To set it up, go to DuckDuckGo's mobile app, Go to settings, tap email protection, and join the wait list because DuckDuckGo says it's going to be a couple of weeks uh, before we can give everybody an address. You'll get a notification in the app when it's time to set up your account. Now, if you're a little wary of letting DuckDuckGo have all your email, the company says the tracker stripping is done in the server's RAM. It never actually downloads the trackers. So your email is also never written to a disk. Uh, it just does it in RAM and sends it along, never gets stored. Uh, so that, that's a good way to do it. Uh, 
this is not a new thing. There's lots of services that do similar things. Even Apple offers kind of a similar thing, and at least as far as the disposable email addresses go. But it's all nicely packaged up in one service, and it's from a company that I think has built up some trust with people as far as protecting your privacy. Yeah, I'm Jen, did you get a duck, dot com email yet? Uh, I'm hoping to. Uh, I will say for everyone else who's trying to get in, if you don't see it yet, update the app. Because I was like, oh, no, are they not offering it in Canada? And they did. I just had to update the app and it showed up. So I'm hoping to. And like the duck.com email address will make all of the phone autocorrect finally helpful for that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I suffer from uh, spam as such a part of life and also spam filters. I mean, I, I've got a email address that I use. It's not my only email address, but it's my primary email address. And, you know, it doesn't catch everything, but it catches most things. And I, it's very rare that something goes into spam that actually wasn't spam. So I think I've just gotten used to a life where I'm like, eh, the spam filters aren't perfect, but they mostly work. Uh, but that doesn't stop my information from floating around all over the place. So this is a good habit to get into. And like you said, Tom, there are other services that have been offering this exact thing for some time, but DuckDuckGo is pretty trusted uh, and it's it's a it's a cool service. Yeah, I mean, you can set Gmail to just not load a bunch of stuff, which would probably do most of what DuckDuckGo is doing here. Uh, and most people aren't going to want to go to the trouble of setting this up and telling everybody, oh, send it to my duck.com email address from now on or, or using that. Uh, this is goodwill, though, for DuckDuckGo to say, you know what, we're providing this. They, they're also creating a browser. They have their mobile browser. They're going to have a desktop browser soon. Uh, so, so they really are just trying to brand themselves as the company that is not trying to invade your privacy to make their business work. Uh, they still sell ads on their search engine. That's where they're making all their money uh, for right now. Uh, but those ads are targeted based on the keywords you search, not on who you are. All, all right. right. Tell me about another way to protect your privacy. Here's another alternative. All right. So before Facebook bought WhatsApp, Neeraj Arora was the chief business officer and Michael Donahue was the engineering director. Arora left in 2018 and Donahue in 2019. The two former WhatsApp employees have just launched a new private social network called Hello App. Hello is available on iOS and Android, supports encrypted chats, and finds your friends by phone numbers. So you'll have to give it access to your contact list to use it. It has four tabs, post from friends, group chats, individual chats, and settings. Everything is sorted entirely chronologically. There is no algorithm. That's it. Really simple. There's no ads and intends to eventually make money by charging subscription fees for some features in the future. You know, it strikes me now with, with the DuckDuckGo story and this, that uh, when, when the dot-com era was happening in the 2000s, the idea of charging for a subscription was a negative. Right. It's like, why not just give it to me free? Uh, because free with ads was not considered to be a problem. We have totally come around to where we're going to charge you. Remember, remember there used to be the scares of like Facebook is going to start charging you and people would freak yeah. out. Right. And get right. angry. Uh, now it's like, hey, we're starting a Facebook competitor. But don't worry, we'll only charge you. <laughs> we're not going to sell ads on this. Uh, I signed up for the Hello app. Uh, not too many of my friends have signed up, so it's not terribly useful now. That's always the rub with messengers is can you get enough people to use it? Uh, but it is nicely designed. It's very simple. So I could see where there's some features in there that people are going to want that they can say, hey, you know, for, you know, $5 a year, uh, we'll give you some of these features. And maybe for $10 a year, we'll give you a few more. Remember, that's what WhatsApp was doing. You, you paid 99 cents once to get a bunch of features in WhatsApp back before Facebook bought them. This is, yeah, I, I, do, I don't want to say that Hello is is a bad idea because it, it actually doesn't sound like a bad idea at all. And there are plenty of folks who say as great as WhatsApp might be and as many people uh, that there are out there using it, I don't want to use a Facebook product. Lots of people feel that way. Um, or you might just, you know, not want to use WhatsApp for other reasons. So it's nice to have an alternative and it being not just a, oh, this is the way that Jen and I talk to each other, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but more of a social network uh, that's a little bit more locked down. Also great. But yeah, it's it's where everybody is. You know, I, I think this is, uh, you know, I don't know how similar it's going to be to something like Path, which was actually a private social network. But for a while, my Path friend group was really active and it was cool. It was like, 
not so much secret conversations, but just a place that was a little bit more for us away from the big social networks. And then it kind of died out and then I had no use for it anymore. So if everybody is having these fun conversations on Hello, I will eventually go there as well. But I kind of follow the herd in that sense. I am hoping to lead some of the herd on that. I am I am actually legitimately excited for this app. These are people who saw what Facebook was doing and said, no, nah, we don't want that, and left, and are starting their own thing. And uh, like most of my fun private chats are with my hockey team, and a lot of them are trying to get away from Facebook, which is impressive for a not-tech audience. That tells you how Facebook has kind of plummeted in that regard. And... Also, for a lot of people who I know who have Twitters and then locked it and don't want to have to deal with like the whole discourse, if the posting is good enough here and if enough of their friends are on it, now you're kind of running your own private Twitter and it's streamlined and it's chronological. Oh, my God, I just want more things to be chronological. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So far, I have two friends on on Hello App, uh, Rich Strathalino and Leo Laporte. And uh, Leo's the only one I've I've actually communicated with on it we we talked about shrimp on the north shore of hawaii so it's it's got a a little ways to go uh, but, but you're off to a good start yeah a delicious start exactly <laughs> Uh, well, this might be delicious uh, if you are a fan of speakers, because Sony announced two high-end home theater products with HDMI 2.1 pass-through ports that support 8K, 4K gaming at 100 hertz, Dolby Vision HDR, eARC, and more. First one is a sound bar called the HTA7000. It supports lots of things, like Dolby Atmos 7.1.2 channel audio, has two HDMI 2.1 inputs, which The Verge notes means you could run something like a PlayStation 5 an Xbox Series X through the single soundbar. Also has two up-firing speakers, two beam tweeters, five front speakers, and a built-in dual subwoofer. Subwoofer in the soundbar. I'm jealous already. It can auto-adapt to your room and supports 360 reality audio, high-res audio, and is compatible with Amazon's Assistant, Google's Assistant, Chromecast, Spotify Connect, and Apple AirPlay 2. The bar will sell for... $1,300. So if you're saying take my money, that's how much money you're going to need. You <laughs> wow. can add a standalone 200 watt subwoofer if you're just like, I need more bass. That'll be another $400. If you want even more bass, a 300 watt subwoofer goes for $700. You can also add wireless rear surround speakers for $350. Now, the other and, in fact, more expensive system is the HTA9. It has four wireless speakers that are just a little bit above one foot and a control box with one HDMI 2.1 input, an Ethernet port, and an auxiliary jack. A Sony TV can act as the center channel on the system. Put the speakers anywhere that they fit, and the system will tune performance accordingly. In fact, Sony's claiming it can create up to 12 phantom speakers by synthesizing sound waves based on the positions of the speakers in whatever room you are using. This set costs eighteen hundred dollars yeah. now both the i know i know i know it's uh it's it's hurting it's hurting already both the hta 7000 and hta 9 will start shipping sometime between september and october that's according to sony so they are right around the corner but they are not cheap they are they're high end i mean these prices are not outrageous for super high-end speakers but yeah, I think with Sony, everybody's like, oh, uh, you know, a mainstream consumer level speaker. Uh, that, that, that's not what they're priced at. And and they're spec'd out very well, too. I mean, these 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 are I, I don't know what they sound like because I haven't heard them. But but these are spec'd out as high end speakers for sure. And the idea of having that flexibility of just, you know, having four speakers, put them wherever you want in the room. The Sony machine learning will figure out, you know, the best way to give you that speaker. That kind of technology is advanced and it works really well now. Uh, Jen, I know you were excited about having two HDMI 2.0 one inputs uh for the game consoles right oh yeah uh like my tv's a bit older and i think like i can get more life out of it by increasing the sound fidelity in my space so all i have to do now is win the lottery that i don't play <laughs> so i can get the two input thing because two inputs are the future i'm surprised that the other one the more expensive one only has one like that two inputs is such a great feature i hope other people in lower end stuff adopt it so i can get one yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I think I'm used to like, oh, I plug my consoles, my Apple TVs and stuff into the TV, and then I use eARC for the one speaker uh, thing. What 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 do you like about having the two HDMIs in the speaker itself? 
uh, because I have a very old smart TV that uh, I already had to put <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, extra things on to get all of my things hooked up. But in the future, when I do upgrade, I'm going to hope that uh, future TVs actually have decent sound or I will look at a sound bar because my brother's running just like a standard sound bar. And I cannot believe how much better it sounds like watching movies and hockey at his place. This sound bar is, I have a sound bar. It's a, it's a, a Sonos uh, Beam. It's very nice. Uh, it works like a charm. It is not this, though. <laughs> and so I look at this and I go, ooh, built-in dual subwoofer. Yep, but I yep. already have an external stub that I paid for. It's like, the, these are the sorts of things that I always get stuck in. Okay, if I was starting from scratch, this is perfect. Because so it's it's got everything, but it's not that big. And, you know, you can mm -hmm. you can add so, so many, um, so much hardware to it. But when you already have a system that you've paid for, it's uh, you know, it just I, I can't I can't upgrade. I have I have no incentive really, except to be cool. Everyone well, in the uh, Twitch chat is saying put it on the live with it list. So I'll I'll do that right now. I'm not guaranteeing it becomes Sarah's live with it, but to, you know, just in case. Yeah, just put it on the list. It's not gonna hurt us. Yeah. Just put it on the list. Uh <laughs> what else uh, might be on your list is something from nothing. Yes, I'm talking about nothing the company. You might think that there's nothing left for nothing to announce about its Ear One earbuds coming July 27th. At least we're getting an announcement about it, something very official. But Carl Pei has been leaking information to various outlets all the same. His latest interview comes from Cena, where he shared photos of the fully transparent case and mostly transparent earbuds. They do look cool. Pei told Cena that the battery life will be 24 hours with noise cancellation on. So more than that, without noise cancellation. And we'll still pay attention next week to see if there are any other details left to announce, price, availability, things like that. I, it's such an interesting strategy that uh, Carl Pay is taking with nothing, where he just keeps leaking out stuff on purpose before it can get leaked out. I mean, I guess he thinks, like, this stuff usually leaks out anyway. Let me just go to CNET and show them the pictures instead of waiting for Android Authority or Android Police or somebody to get a hold of them and leak them for me. Uh, I I mean, other than price and availability, I'm not sure what's left to announce next week, but we'll see. Hey, patrons, uh, did you know your ad-free RSS feed can have just DTNS or just GDI or both? Uh, check your tier on Patreon. If it says DTNS, you get DTNS. If it says GDI, you get GDI. If it says all, you get them both. If you want to change that, just change your tier, and it will change what shows up in your RSS feed. That's all at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. RCS stands for RC Colas. No, it stands for Rich Communication Service. It's a standard meant to replace SMS, uh, simple messaging service. RCS lets mobile carriers interoperate while sending higher resolution pictures, video, read receipts, supporting group chats. Now you may say, I could already do that in the Messenger app on my phone right now. Uh, that's because your app is handling some of that or your carrier is doing other workarounds. The, the fact that you don't have RCS on a lot of these phones is why sometimes people on phones with differing operating systems don't see messages the same way, or if you've ever had a group chat broken up into separate individual conversations, that's why. But starting next year, Verizon will support RCS and preload, preload Android messages as its default texting app on all Verizon Android phones. That follows AT&T and T-Mobile, who have already uh, said they're doing the same thing. Google's implementation of RCS also interoperates with other RCS systems around the world, and there are about 473 million active RCS users worldwide, so full support in the U.S. is going to boost that even higher. But there's one big outlier. RCS is not yet supported by Apple's iOS, which makes for an interesting security situation. Android Messages' implementation of RCS supports end-to-end -end encryption for one-to-one -one conversations and will soon support it for group chats. Apple's Messenger app, the Messages app, has end-to-end -end encryption with other iOS users, but not if you fall back to SMS. You're end-to-end -end encrypted with the blue texts, not the green ones, because SMS doesn't support it. But RCS does support end-to-end -end encryption. However, because Apple doesn't support RCS, that means when an Apple user and an Android user text each other, it falls back to SMS, meaning Android conversations with iOS users are less secure. So 
Google did some gentle nudging today. Senior Vice President of Android Chrome OS in the Play Store, Hiroshi Lockheimer, told The Verge, the fallback messaging experience on the other platform, I think we know what other platform he's talking about, will not have encryption if it's still SMS. I think that is a pretty interesting dynamic, and I would hope that as everyone focuses on security and privacy, it becomes an important part of the discussion. Uh, a very gentle way of saying, Apple, come on, support RCS. I don't think he's wrong. I don't, you know, I there's there's really no reason for Apple. I mean, the only, the only and incredibly dumb argument would be for Apple to say, well, you should just get an iPhone and then you don't have any issues. <laughs> yeah, that right. is just, you know what I mean? Like, otherwise it just, it doesn't make any sense for Apple to be a holdout on something that is, is 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 going to make compatibility better and security better for everybody. My one question would be, uh, because like everything does SMS, is RCS more complicated on phones to run or can pretty much every phone out there handle RCS and chooses not to because say Apple and iMessage? Because that yeah. would be my only concern worldwide and I don't know enough about phones to answer that. So I'm putting it to you, Tom. RCS has been around for a while. My guess is all but the oldest phones should be able to handle it just fine. It's a standard, and almost every phone can send images and do group chats if you're doing it within the ecosystem, right? They can all do it on WhatsApp. They can all do it uh, within messages, uh, even on older iPhones. So, yeah, I don't I don't think that would I, – I can't think of any reason why that would be a hang-up. Uh, the only other re thing I could think of is Apple – looking at all the work they did to support read receipts and multimedia messaging and everything on messages and saying, but our implementation is better than the standard, which you often see Apple do. They're saying, yeah, there's a standard, but ours is better. Uh, in which case I could see them reluctant to support RCS. But I, I, I just, if you support SMS as your fallback, why not just change to supporting RCS as your fallback Maybe they were waiting for it to get popular enough to make, to make it worth the effort to implement, but I think we're there. I think it's popular enough now. Yeah. Or well, at the iPhone event in September, which is not announced yet, but let's just assume Apple yeah. decides to invent RCS. <laughs> yeah. That is. I mean, I'm kind of only half kidding. That no, sometimes I think you're like 92 percent chance of being right. There is that Apple <laughs> announces uh, a support for a great new standard out there. Uh, right. And yeah. They, better security than ever for yeah. our Apple customers. They never call it RCS. It's only called RCS on the graphic that's up behind them. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just magically <laughs> compatible. Mm -hmm. And they also have to do something about their security on messages because there's a couple of zero days where you don't even have to open the message for your phone to be compromised. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's what we were talking about with the, um, um, oh, we just we just mentioned it at the beginning of the show. Uh, the NSO group. Yeah, the yep. Pegasus thing. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, having a, having a fallback standard uh, is not new for Apple. They did it with SMS. Time to upgrade. Time to upgrade that fallback standard to RCS. Uh, I, I think now now is the time. And maybe that's why... Uh, Hiroshi is being being so gentle. He knows. He, he they're gonna do it. It's fine. Next up, we have Snob OS's Nika Monford is back with another spotlight on a black tech entrepreneur in this month's Teching While Black. Hi, this is Nika Monford, aka Tech Savvy Diva of the Snob OS Show. In the Teching While Black segment, I will bring awareness to a Black technology leader who is advancing the tech community through their innovations across the spectrum of industries. Today in Teching While Black, let's highlight Tope Otana, founder and CEO of Calendly, the number one and fastest growing company in scheduling automation. A native of Nigeria and transplant to Atlanta, Georgia, he bootstrapped Calendly single-handedly by emptying his retirement accounts, maxing out credit cards, and taking out small business loans, all in the midst of quitting his corporate sales job. The company that he founded is the fourth, fourth U.S. company with a Black founder to be valued above $1 billion. With a $350 million investment earlier this year from OpenView Venture Partners and Iconic, the current valuation is $3 billion. This is where he is now, but where he started from was graduating high school two years early, then going on to the University of Georgia as a graduate in management information systems. 
At 18, he patented his idea to use optical character recognition to determine which bills were being used and dispensed after noticing the cash register at his part-time job was not calculating correctly. He pitched his idea to NCR, which was interested in the technology, but he ultimately turned down NCR's offer. He had several other startup companies before Calendly, including Single to Taken, Projector Spot, and Yard Steals. Needless to say, his early years led him to be the CEO and founder that he is today. To find out more about Tope and his work, you can follow him on Twitter at the handle at Tope Otana. History is being made in real time every single day, so let's celebrate it now. When we are aware of all innovative voices, especially those in underrepresented groups, the tech community thrives. Be sure to tune in to the next Teching While Black, where we highlight Black innovators from around the globe. Thank you, Nika. Uh, good stuff. Every month, Nika from snobboscast.com, uh, bringing us another entrepreneur on Calendly. I bet a lot of people use it and don't even know the story behind it. So that, that was fascinating to me. Uh, by the way, in our chat, Bigfoot NRG said, uh, or... Apple opens up iMessages protocol for all platforms to use and then chastises other companies for not implementing it. <laughs> it's another, another possibility there. All right. We're saying goodbye to the inexplicable $10 paid for alien emoji or the $20 for drugs. Ha, ha, ha. You know you've seen it. And that's right. Venmo is ending the practice of showing you a global feed of payments from people you don't know who paid for things and then told the world about it. You will now only see payments from your friends or private payments between you and another person if you wanna look at that view as well. Venmo says, this change allows customers to connect and share meaningful moments and experiences with the people who matter most, also money. I, um never understood and maybe i'm just too old but i never understood why venmo by default so a lot of people didn't even realize it was on put all of your transactions public in a feed on venmo i mean it was a different time when venmo launched everything was social and nobody was suspicious of it i guess i don't know uh, i do think guys? it i think in the early days it was meant to just drum up interest and then yeah. adoption like oh look at all these people that are sharing stuff and some of the you know the little reasons that because you always have to give a reason for what the payment's for you know they're funny or clever or there's so much there's so much going on i felt that way i also quickly felt like oh God, i don't need the whole world to know about you know, me paying my landlord for something or yeah, or it just, it, I couldn't think of any time that I would pay for something that I wanted to share. Although as a fly on the wall of global payments, it was very interesting. I know I wasn't alone. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter today going, oh man, I love global payments. Feed. <laughs> you know, I wish, I wish they'd let me still spy on everybody, but it's, it's honestly, a huge security issue. Um, I'll give you a, a quick example. I used to pay one of my landlords on Venmo and I moved out of this particular apartment a long time ago. And for whatever reason, he kind of showed up in my, I guess he's in my friend's feed. Oh, he's uh, in your as, yeah, right. Yeah, he's in my contacts. And I clicked on his name and I could see everything going in and out from his accounts. So people who were for sure not in my contacts who were paying him were still showing up in the feed of his that I could see. And like, let's just say I wanted to, you know, know when somebody was about to move into my old apartment, like I could kind of figure that mm -hmm. out from the deposit that they just sent him. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, I'm not going to do anything with that information, but I don't think they would, you know, if they really thought about it, they wouldn't want me to know that either. That is alarmingly so. public, and I'm so happy that it's closed. <laughs> Venmo's it's, not yeah. as huge up here, but like, yeah, people watching, that would be just incredibly fascinating. But the fact that you can click on one of your friends and see what like friends of their friends are doing, it's just, oh no, this is spiraled out of control. Yeah, yeah I know. Oh, thank goodness Venmo money isn't real. All right, uh, let's <laughs> check out the mailbag. <laughs> 
Uh, Steven sent us a message. He actually sent it through Patreon and said, I'm really loving Seniors in Tech. Seniors in Tech is our is our uh, limited podcast series that we've been running on Saturdays in our DTNS feed. So thank you, Steven. Steven said, definitely busting stereotypes and so brilliantly presented. And, you know, we agree. Dr. Nikki Ackermans has done such a good job. And uh, actually, we have one more episode that'll be in the DTNS feed this Saturday. And if you are enjoying stuff like this, and you'd like us to do more, whether it's this series or something that you think we might uh, be able to tackle, well, please do let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Yeah. And Phil messaged us through Patreon saying he's always disappointed when he doesn't hear his name in the show. So there you go, Phil. Phil, you matter. Yeah. <laughs> we, hear, we hear you, Phil. <laughs> if there's anything else we can do for you, please do let us Phil know or anyone. feedback. At dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. But seriously, uh, your feedback is super appreciated. Keep it coming. Also, shout out to patrons that are master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include David Mosher, Dan Boyles, and Logan Larson. We'd also like to give an extra special thanks to Rushon Brantley, one hey. of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Rushon. You are the best. Yeah, Rushon's also, been with us a long time. Nice, nice, a really nice long time, thing. yeah. Top lifetime supporter. Uh, matters matters uh, matters a lot. So thank you so much. Thanks also to Jen Cutter for being with us today. Uh, Jen, what's going on when you're not doing headlines and, and this show? Uh, well, I recently took up kayaking, but that's a side thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everything uh, usually about me yelling about games is on Twitter, which is Twitter at Jen Cutter, and that is Jen with two N's. Very cool. We are live Monday through Friday on this show, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. If you can join us live, we would love to have you. You can also find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back at it tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. Bye, Phil. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>